This episode of Lore and Legends will tell a version, albeit a condensed and paraphrased version, of the Navajo story of creation and the emergence of the first man and the first woman of the world. I say paraphrased and condensed because as with many cultures and stories around the world at one point or another, this story existed in an oral tradition for who knows how long before it was actually written down. Stories were retold and remembered across generations, resulting in a host of versions of this story, some longer and some shorter, with varying degrees of details and differences. Keep in mind, I'm not claiming to be an expert, or even that familiar with Navajo culture in general, so please don't take offense if I put something in the wrong place. I'll certainly list some sources in the show notes and other places you can go for more detailed versions. And by all means, feel free to discuss or debate it on Facebook or at loreandlegends.net. That being said, I think you'll find this interesting. After all, creation stories are the starting point for all of the stories that follow it. And as such, they are uniquely interesting, in my opinion. The story begins in the first world, the dark world, the black world. This world was small, like an island, and at each of the four corners were the beings that inhabited this world. They did not have a familiar form, but were recognizable only in character. As their populations grew, and the first world became crowded, and they fought with one another and committed crimes against each other, the gods became angry, and the first man and woman, along with Coyote, were ordered to leave the first world. They entered the second world through a hole in the east, where a swallow had peeked through. This new world was blue, and in it existed a variety of new creatures. The swallow people, along with a variety of blue-colored birds and other animals, but the second world was a violent world. There was war and adultery, and despite their best efforts, the first man and the first woman, still unrecognizable, couldn't make peace. Just as the swallow had invited them in, he asked them to leave, sure that they were kicked from the first world for similar reasons. The third world was entered through a hole in the south, and its color was yellow. The beings were still not in the recognizable form we see today. In the late fall, they began to hear a distant but great voice steadily approaching, until appearing before them were four strange and powerful beings. The first was White Body, the chief god of the world, followed by Blue Body, who they called the Sprinkler, Yellow Body, and Black Body, the god of fire. These four beings spoke and made signs and gestures to the people, but the people could not understand them. The mysterious gods left, and the people debated amongst themselves the meaning of it all. The beings returned for four consecutive days, but were never understood. Until the fourth day, Blackbody, the god of fire, stayed behind. He spoke to the people in their own language. You don't seem to understand our language and signs, so I'll tell you what they mean. So he told them that he and the other gods of this world wanted to make them into forms like their own, with arms, legs, hands, feet, and teeth. He told them they would return in twelve days, but that the people smelled very bad and should wash themselves before they return. On the morning of the twelfth day, the people washed themselves. The men dried themselves with white cornmeal and the women with yellow. They could hear the four gods approaching in the distance. The gods laid a buckskin on the ground with the head facing the west. On top, two ears of corn, one white and one yellow, with the tips facing the east. Under the white ear of corn was placed a white eagle feather, and under the yellow ear, a yellow eagle feather. Another buckskin was placed with its head facing east. The gods told everyone to stand back and let the wind through. The wind blew between the buckskins, and eight more gods appeared. They were called the Mirage People, and they circled the objects four times. The eagle feathers began to move, and when the Mirage People finished, the buckskins were lifted, and in the place of the ears of corn was a fully formed man and a fully formed woman. It was the sacred wind that gave them life. The gods ordered a hut of brushwood to be built where the first man and first woman would live as husband and wife. In four days' time, the woman bore a set of hermaphrodite twins, and in four more days, a boy and a girl, and then three more sets of twins after that, each four days apart. After the last of the twins were born, the gods returned and took the first man and the first woman away with them to the mountains in the east. After they returned, they took their children to the mountains. The gods taught them the secrets of witchcraft, 
and some of the early people became witches. They married people close to them, and eventually the sons of man married the daughters of the Mirage people, and the daughters of man married the sons of the Mirage people. The early people kept these relationships secret, but they continued to have children and filled the world with people. One day, they managed to kill a small deer, and wondered how they could disguise themselves to get even more. They tried unsuccessfully to make a mask from the deer, and squabbled over it for four days, after which the gods intervened and taught them how to make masks and to wear the deer skins, and to move like them. Many deer were taken afterwards, and the people had an abundance of meat, and began to make clothes from the buckskins. After a while, the first man and the first woman got into an argument over dinner. The first man decided he no longer wanted anything to do with his wife, or women at all for that matter. So he gathered up all the men and the boys, and they reluctantly moved to the other side of the river, leaving behind most of what they had built and farmed to the women. During the first year of separation, the women were very successful and had an abundance of food. The men struggled, but managed to survive by hunting and building new huts. The women would often come to the shores of the river and taunt the men and take pleasure in doing so. Then the second year came, and the men began to be a bit more successful at farming, and the women replanted their own crops, but were not as successful at working the land, and they had less food than they did the previous year. The women were not quite as happy as they were in the first year, and they no longer jeered the men at the river. In the third year of separation, things were very different. The men were now successfully farming in addition to hunting, while the women's crops had dwindled significantly. The women took to gathering wild nuts and seeds, but it wasn't quite enough. Some women began trying to cross the river, but disappeared under the current. In the fourth year, the women's camp had become unlivable, and the men soon realized the women would starve. And they also realized that without women, their own numbers would age and dwindle until there were no humans left at all. So, they built rafts and ferried the women over to their side of the river, but they soon realized that three women were missing. They could hear them shouting, but it had gotten too dark to rescue them. Distraught, the mother and her two daughters jumped into the river to swim across. The mother made it, but the daughters were taken captive by a water monster. They searched and listened for the girls for three days, but could not find them. Until the fourth day, when White Body and Blue Body, two of the gods of that world, appeared to them and gestured under the water and opened the waters for the first man and the first woman to search for the missing girls. Coyote went along with them. They searched the great house of the water monster until they found him with the missing girls and two children of his own. They demanded their children be returned and with them left the lair of the water monster. But no one noticed that Coyote had stolen the water monster's own children as they left. The next day, they awoke to animals running through their camp. For three days, the stampeding animals increased in number, and on the fourth day, they could see a light in the east. They sent out messengers, who returned and said a great flood was approaching. The people wept and wailed at the impending doom. The next day, they could see the waters rising as high as the mountains, and they grabbed everything they could carry and set out for the highest hill. But it wasn't high enough. Atop the hill was first planted a cedar, and then a pine tree, but neither of them grew tall enough to escape the floodwaters. A medicine man appeared and planted several reeds next to each other and prayed over them. They grew into one giant reed, and all the people and creatures rushed inside of it, including the gods. The water rose higher and higher, but the reed kept growing. Until finally, nearing the top of the world, they began to look for an opening to yet another world. Eventually, they found the opening and entered into the fourth world, the white world. But the waters from below hadn't stopped, and they were approaching the whole of the fourth world, until they began to suspect that something was going on, because Coyote had not taken off his robes the entire time. They tackled him, and out of his robes came the two children of the water monster. They quickly took the two children and tossed them into the hole back into the third world. The waters immediately began subsiding, and that is how humanity got to where we are today. And now for a quick break. A few things stood out to me in this tale. The first, of course, being the supernatural history of it all. Gods mingling with people. And then, a husband and wife arguing over dinner 
and separating only to realize in the end they need each other if humanity is to survive. Which is perhaps the beginning of a sort of moral framework. And of course, there's the current world being preceded by a world that was destroyed in a flood caused by a water monster who was ticked off thanks to our mischievous old pal Coyote who thought he could exact some clever revenge and get away with it. Also, the number four stands out. Lots of religions and cultures make use of certain numbers or sets of numbers, and in this case, it comes in fours. There are four sacred mountains, four worlds, and the rituals and major events involve the number four one way or another. And did you catch that the holes between worlds were open and could be found? And that the creatures and beings in each world were different? This story continues in many instances, with the early happenings in the New World. I'll leave some links over at loreandlegends.net, where you can follow up with that and check out other versions of the story for yourself. There will be some future episodes that touch on some aspects that are briefly touched on in this episode, namely witches, and perhaps the Mirage people. You'll want to check out loreandlegends.net for more on that. Remember in the story when the gods taught people to make and wear masks? and it helped them hunt their prey? Is that sort of a first step towards a foreshadowing of something more insidious in Navajo and other Native American lore you may have heard of? Skinwalkers is what I'm talking about there. And who are the Mirage people, the mysterious beings that participated in the creation ritual, connected to the gods somehow, but perhaps not totally present in a physical body? But that's where I'm going to end this episode. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. There will be a couple of direct follow-ups to this one. You can also follow me at facebook.com slash loreandlegends and on minds.com where you can find my handle at Obi Wade. And of course, the official website, loreandlegends.net where you'll find even more show-related content and episode notes. This episode in particular, I feel like there's a pretty good blog post that's going to fill in some good details and give you some other places you can go look for more if it interests you. Also, if you like the podcast, consider chipping in at paypal.me slash loreandlegends. It's greatly appreciated. Again, check out the episode description for links to all of these things. That's all I had for this episode. See you next time. The theme music in this episode, In Order of Occurrence. The Complex, by Kevin McQuia, and available at incompetech.com. Licensed through Creative Commons, by Attribution 4.0. River Fire, by Kevin McQuia, available at incompetech.com. Licensed by Creative Commons, by Attribution 4.0. Jalandar, by Kevin McQuia, and available at incompetech.com. Licensed through Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.